a very good morning to all of you. And I'm Tatsura Virutunga, and you're joining with the Continuous Professional Development Program uh, organized by the Society of Health Research and Innovation. Moving on to the uh, housekeeping details. Please know that the session will be recorded and we kind of request you to keep your mics muted and video switched off for minimal disturbance. The webinar link will be available from 9 a.m. to 9.50 a.m. for you to join in, and please note that no late attendees will be attended, entertained thereafter. Each attendee should attend until the end of the webinar to obtain the certificate for CPD points, and the CPD points are strictly adhered to the National Certificate of Continuous Professional Development Guidelines. This is to improve and maintain the standards of the CPD programs conducted by SHRI and thanking you for the strict adherence of the CPD regulations and for your kind compliance, let's move on to the details on asking questions. Please note that there's a question time at the end of the webinar. If you have any questions, please type it into the chat box and make sure that you change your chat setting to all panelists and attendees so your questions can be answered. If you have very specific questions, you're, please feel free to email us on the email address given in the screen. So joining with us today is Dr. Thomas Georgeson. He's an adult and pediatric emergency physician from the Canberra Hospital Australia. And Dr. Georgeson is a bachelor in medicine and science, and he has completed masters in public health and a diploma in child health. He's a fellow of the Australian College of Emergency Medicine and has completed his subspeciality qualification in pediatric emergency medicine. He's an honorary visiting fellow of the University of Peradenia and is also a member of the examination committee of the fourth year medical students in Australian National University. Dr. Thomas Georgeson will be discussing with us today about the Kawasaki disease. Over to you, Dr. Georgeson. Okay, hello everyone, <clears throat> and thank you for this opportunity to speak to you today. It's a great honor, and I really look forward to discussing this topic. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Um, it's wonderful to have this opportunity to speak to you all, and um, today I'm going to talk about Kawasaki disease. Uh, and in particular, during this talk, I'll be uh, referring to some cases that um, from my experience in Australia, um, and I hope that you have some, uh, some interesting thoughts and discussions from, from this presentation. I'm going to begin with a case history. So uh, these are all real cases, the ones that I'm going to present today. Um, so there was a four-year-old boy uh, of Asian ethnicity, uh, this is in Australia, who had been unwell with fever for six days. Uh, he had rhinorrhea, vomiting, and then he developed cracked lips and a red tongue. That was on day two. He was started on Augmentum uh, on day three, continued to have fever and then presented to the ED on day four of the illness. Um, at that time, it was noted that he was starting to have some erythema of the hands and he was referred back to the ED by the GP on the sixth day with ongoing fever. Interestingly, you'll note for those of you who know something about Kawasaki, and we'll discuss that a little bit further in a second. Um, this is really showing all the classic features of Kawasaki, uh, but raises an interesting question in that a lot of the diagnosis seems quite available even before the fifth day, but Kawasaki itself uh, in the diagnostic criteria uh, shouldn't be, uh, should not really be diagnosed until the fifth day. So something interesting to reflect on just to start with. So, let's have a, this is the case. Now, when we examined the patient, um, he looked actually looked reasonably well. He had a fever uh, to 39 degrees and nasal congestion. He had some small bilateral cervical lymph nodes. Um, he had some conjunctivitis, a red tongue and cracked lips. And he had some erythema of the palms developing but at that point, they were not obviously swollen and there was no desquamation uh, of his hands at this point. These were our investigations. Um, and actually, 
aside from the inflammatory markers, um, nothing especially remarkable here. Um, so um, today we're going to talk about Kawasaki disease. I'm going to talk about the general features of Kawasaki disease. I'm going to talk about incomplete Kawasaki syndrome, an entity which you may not be that familiar with. And I'm also going to talk about Kawasaki disease shock syndrome. Um, so let's talk about Kawasaki disease to start with. Now the etiology of Kawasaki disease is not completely clear. Um, it's considered due to one or more widely distributed infectious disease agents that evoke an abnormal immune response in genetically susceptible individuals. There is a seasonal variation um, and it's more typically occurring in winter and spring in temperate countries. It varies in different climates and there is actually a well-established ethnic predisposition uh, in that um, the, the world's highest incidence occurs in Japan and Korea. Um, and within the USA itself, where there's been larger studies done, um, there seems to be greater prevalence amongst um, Asian background as a, then African-American background, Hispanic and white populations. There's a different ratio between male and female patients. Uh, the ratio is higher. There's a higher preponderance in male patients. Um, and usually the age is within the sort of distribution of six months to four years. Um, in terms of familial history, there's a 10 to 15 fold increased incidence in siblings. And interesting, there's a recurrence in twins. Um, the recurrence rate varies. Uh, and actually, I think in Japan, some studies have suggested that up to 3% recurrence rate. So that's quite significant for a patient to have it more than once. What is the pathology of Kawasaki disease? Well, um, in general, what we see are mononuclear cells and platelets that are activated, leading to this inflammatory cascade. Um, and in, in particular, vascular endothelial growth factor seems to be highly involved. Now, there's an infiltration of the vascular wall, um, which leads to some breakdown of the vascular wall degeneration. And this is really what leads to the aneurysmal development in arterial walls. And in addition to this, there's a sort of subacute or chronic vasculitis um, with intimal wall thickening. These um, pathological changes that occur in the child are enormously important because later in life they can become highly significant. Um, up to 25% of patients who have had Kawasaki disease will end up developing coronary artery disease. And it is in fact the most common cause of acquired heart disease in children in the developed countries. And that won't account for other differences in uh, developing countries, but certainly in the developed world. Um, you may have evidence that the lumen of the arteries will completely normalize in the acute phase, but there's underlying structural changes which predispose to later disease. And when you do CT coronary uh, angiography in older patients, uh, you'll see that there's um, abnormal calcification where there really shouldn't be. And that's, we're talking about patients in their 20s and 30s, for instance, uh, where you would not expect to see those changes. That leads to these long-term effects, um, you know, not only of stenosis and uh, thrombus formation, but also there, is a, there can be valve involvement as well. So this is the criteria, and I raise this because um, you can see from the earlier case, we could have almost diagnosed that patient before day five. You've got to have fever of at least five days, polymorphic rash, bilateral conjunctivitis without exudate, um, erythema of the oral uh, and pharyngeal mucosa, and the classic strawberry tongue um, with cracking of the lips. And then you get this erythema and edema of the palms and soles in the acute phase, which then in the later phase leads to desquamation. And in addition to all this, we have cervical lymphadenopathy. Now, that's all well and good to understand what those criteria are, but 
it does, uh, it is helpful to think more broadly about how common those are when you're trying to establish the diagnosis. So fever and the mucocutaneous changes are the most common. Um, but uh, there's a lot of patients, particularly younger patients, who do not have lymphadenopathy. Um, uh, ex non exudative conjunctivitis is very common. So up to, you know, close to or more than 90% of patients in large studies have been shown to have that. Uh, and there's limbic sparing, a very important aspect of, um, of Kawasaki. The discrete oral lesions are less suggestive of Kawasaki disease. And one of the reasons for that is that they're very common in lots of illnesses. Uh, so it's important to kind of have a, a view of this when you're looking for a diagnosis for Kawasaki to appreciate what are the more important features or the more common ones. Um, in terms of cutaneous features, they can be very polymorphic. Um, you can get peri perineal changes as well, uh, which is not widely known. Um, you can get all sorts of patches uh, on the trunk and extremities. And the extremity changes, which are very typical of Kawasaki, where you get edema and erythema of the hands, they often occur late, and that's important to recognise as well. Um, I mean, ideally, this disease should be recognised as soon as possible and treatment started um, you know, at the first possible time of diagnosis rather than a delay. Here I'm going to show you a couple of photos of some things uh, from Kawasaki patients. Um, you've got this conjunctival injection uh, with some sparing around the limbus. Here you can see the different facets of rash uh, uh, and cutaneous changes which you can see in Kawasaki patients. And you might recognise from your own work that these patterns are not particularly suggestive just of Kawasaki. There are a lot of different illnesses which can manifest itself in this way, which is what makes Kawasaki difficult. The patient I presented is a classic case who have almost all those features very early in the illness, but the reality is you won't see that all the time. And that's why you have to be alert to uh, the diagnosis and thinking about the different features. Here's a feature which is, you know, uh, almost pathognomic. There are some conditions which can replicate this, but once you start to see the edema of the hands in the right context like this, you know, you're very, very suspicious for Kawasaki disease. The um, mouth changes, many of you would recognise, uh, can be replicated by other viral illnesses. Um, herpes simplex, uh, hand, foot and mouth disease would be some of the more common ones in our environment. Uh, drug reactions, although that's less common in children, but certainly worth re recalling or, or considering. Now, there are laboratory features of Kawasaki disease which help support your diagnosis. And I'm gonna, these, I'm gonna suggest them now, but um, when we get to incomplete Kawasaki disease, you realize that these are very, very important. So you, may see normal or elevated white cell count. The CRP and the ESR should be elevated. A low serum sodium is quite common, as is a low albumin. You can see changes in liver enzymes. Um, sterile pyuria is common, although once again, that's common in other things as well. And then thrombocytosis, but importantly, is more likely to occur in the second week. So looking for thrombocytosis early will not necessarily help you particularly if the plan or the goal is to start treatment at an earlier stage as possible. What are the spectrum of disease here? So we've talked about some of the cardiac uh, complications and they certainly in the long term are the most important things which we're recognizing. But you can get hepatitis, interstitial pneumonitis, you can get a whole range of gastrointestinal manifestations. In the CNS, you can get aseptic meningitis and irritability. Pyuria, as I mentioned a moment ago, pancreatitis, arthritis, and urethritis. So it is a really multi-organ illness. And that goes with, of course, lots of vasculitis. When we, this, what, this is a study from Australia, trying to establish who is most at risk of getting coronary artery disease, because that's really our long-term goal. Uh, is to prevent coronary artery disease by appropriate treatment. And importantly, it's where you don't have complete criteria, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment because it's so important. Young age, and young age is difficult. I mentioned earlier on that 
the younger patients don't have lympho, uh, have less commonly have lymphadenopathy, but the diagnosis in general is more complex in a younger age, and delay the treatment. And we've discussed that sort of along the way here, that um, getting the treatment at the earliest possible stage is really important. And because of incomplete criteria and because of the difficulties sometimes in differentiating this disease from other entities, there can be delays, and if the further the delays go on, the more likely you are to have long-term coronary artery disease. So what is the treatment? In Australia, these are the guidelines, which this is what we use for treatment, and I'm going to, in a stepwise fashion, and sometimes you need to use more than one treatment. We use uh, intravenous immunoglobulin, uh, and the mechanism of treatment is generally unknown, but it has a sort of generalised anti-inflammatory effect. You can have complications, as you might be aware, from this treatment in other conditions. Um, and usually it's given in conjunction with high-dose high aspirin, although that is the dosing of aspirin uh, has some differences of opinion in the literature. And I've put the, some of the doses here. You can see that this is very high-dose aspirin. We would very rarely use this sort of aspirin for any condition, uh, let alone in children. So it's interesting. Um, how specialised this treatment is. If those fail, there's alternatives. And in fact, these alternatives are used in other parts of the world. Um, so single dose, uh, dose pulse methylprednisolone. Um, in our uh, community, we would use repeat IVIG if there wasn't uh, you know, adequate initial response. And then for very resistant um, Kawasaki disease, we use infliximab. I've never seen cyclosporin used, but that's another possibility. And you can see the level C evidence not particularly strong. This is where people are not, not entirely sure what to do, I believe. Uh, and that can be a difficulty in resistant cases. Now I'm going to go through another case just to kind of uh, emphasize some of the points which we've been bringing out. Now we have a younger child who's 10 months old. He's had fever for six days rhinorrhea, a polymorphic rash, and has pharyngitis and cracked lips. And for those of you who've worked in emergency medicine, or particularly in pediatric emergency medicine, you realise that there's, you know, certainly a number of diagnoses that can present this way. So it's complex. This, on its first view, doesn't appear to be necessarily Kawasaki disease. We would, in general, after five days of fever, certainly look for Kawasaki disease, but this, was not, this is not classic features yet. And so this raises the spectre of something called incomplete Kawasaki disease, which is a very well-known diagnosis of the, uh, and established in literature and guidelines at this point, but difficult for the diagnostician. In thinking about incomplete Kawasaki disease, it's worth just mentioning some of these other um, alternative differentials, because this is the problem with uh, incomplete Kawasaki disease. I've already mentioned that the treatments for Kawasaki disease are IVIG and extremely high dose aspirin, not to mention the other treatments. And we're not going to be giving those to patients which we're not certain have got Kawasaki disease. So you need to be really clear what you're treating. Those treatments certainly wouldn't be you know, necessarily correct for these uh, different illnesses on this page. But this is toxic so shock syndrome certainly uh, occurs in children. A measles and adenovirus, I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, strep scarlet fever is a big problem in our community uh, and can be one of the really, uh, um, one of those diagnoses that seems to imitate or very similar to Kawasaki. Um, and Stephen Johnson syndrome, which I must admit is quite rare in a pediatric community, but does occur occasionally. So looking at these, you can see there's some, some differences along the side there, which help you uh, sort of differentiate the two. But some of those are a little subtle. For instance, when we talk about measles and adenovirus and we say, well, it generally lacks extremity changes, you have to bear in mind, as I mentioned earlier on, that the extremity changes in Kawasaki often occur late. So while it looks nice when you put this on a table, in real life, when you're on day four, day five of an illness like this and you don't have extremity changes yet, it doesn't necessarily, it's not a very easy thing to differentiate between the two, say an adenovirus, particularly in our community, um, since we have high levels of vaccination to measles, we don't see a lot of measles. But differentiating adenovirus from Kawasaki just because the patient doesn't have extremity changes is a tricky thing to do. So what are things that make it less likely to be Kawasaki? 
So exudative conjunctivitis, so it should be non-exudative. Pharyngitis with exudate as well, generally speaking, that's not something we should be seeing. That suggests more likely a bacterial complication, uh, a bacterial pharyngitis. Ulcerative intraoral lesions are not typical. They're typical of many other conditions, but not of Kawasaki. And dorsal vesicular rashes, um, which can occur in things like chickenpox and, uh, and, and other conditions as well. Likewise, a generalized adenopathy is not, not common either. Okay, so we've talked about the predilection to cervical lymph nodes. And splenomegaly uh, is not a typical thing for Kawasaki. Now here's the problem, and here is actually the, the, uh, you know, the algorithm developed by the American Heart Association to deal with incomplete Kawasaki disease. So once again, you need to have fever for five days, but you don't need to have the same number of diagnostic criteria. It's more common in younger children, and in fact, you're very much still at risk of those coronary artery complications, but it's difficult to differentiate. And what incomplete Kawasaki disease does is that it starts to use laboratory criteria, which for normal or standard Kawasaki disease are not part of the diagnostic criteria, but in incomplete Kawasaki they are. So here we go, the evaluation of suspected incomplete Kawasaki disease, and this is from the American Heart Association guidelines. And essentially, what you can see is you start to use initially inflammatory markers, oh, that's on the right side, and then starting to look at all the additional laboratory findings and criteria. And these include anemia, platelet counts, albumin levels, LFTs, white cell counts, and looking for the urine as well. So what are the groups that can go unrecognized? So certainly prolonged fever and irritability in an infant under six months. Um, infants with prolonged fever and unexplained, you know, aseptic meningitis. I'm going to talk about Kawasaki disease shock syndrome in a moment. So we'll get to that shortly. Um, and children who are not responding to antibiotics. Uh, it's interesting having been here in Sri Lanka now for 18 months, I think that um, it's interesting to reflect upon uh, the role of dengue and how that might play in the diagnosis of Kawasaki in this community. Um, it certainly changes things compared to how I'm used to operating back in Australia. I think the attitude to fever and some of these features as well, um, which, you know, it makes it potentially even more difficult diagnosis um, than it is for us. And I'm, I believe that many of the people listening to this would have, you know, a much stronger foundation in understanding dengue than I do. Um, but it, it, it does make things quite tricky. Um, here in, just to see whether this is a true entity or, or what, what's known about it, 17% of, pa of patients in this series have incomplete Kawasaki. So that's, not, it's, that's almost one fifth of patients. And you can see the rates of cardiac complications, they were much higher, and that's partly due to the lack of recognition um, and the difficulty in getting treatment started and in fact, you know, in incomplete Kawasaki in our community, it's not uncommon that patients will, um, you know, need to uh, will only be starting treatment really, you know, six, seven, eight days in um, or even later. And that's part of the problem really with incomplete Kawasaki. Let's have a look at this case now. So um, this is a case from, from Sydney, 21 month old girl who came to the emergency department with a two-day history of irritability, vomiting and diarrhea, rash and fever. Now she was admitted for 48 hours, um, had a lot of watery diarrhea, was given a large volume of fluid for signs of hypoperfusion and poor urine output. Um, now 60 to 70 mils per kilo uh, in our community is, is unusual. Okay, that's quite a decent volume. Um, with a higher level of uh, diarrhea, you know, it's not entirely unexpected, but it certainly raises some questions. Mostly children would be able to tolerate oral, um, you know, with gastroenteritis in sufficient quantities to not need that much fluid. Here, importantly, what you can see is this renal dysfunction. She was treated more or less as sepsis, and this looks like a whole, not, <laughs> if you look at the antibiotics which were given to her, it's not actually entirely just sepsis. Uh, they really didn't know what was going on at this point because whenever you see that many antibiotics given to a patient, you can assume that despite the uh, 
great intelligence of the medical community, uh, you can be confident that people weren't quite sure what the diagnosis was once you see that many treatments given. Now she deteriorated um, and developed a borderline blood pressure and fever continued and started now to generate some of those features which are more typical of Kawasaki. And this is after she had already really been in shock um, where you're seeing you know, these, these type of uh, um, criteria. In Sydney, there's a thing called NETS. Um, that's a retrieval service, uh, which took this patient to uh, a, a major children's hospital where she was admitted to the PICU or intensive care unit. Here's the sort of investigations that she had at the PICU. Now, the platelets, it's interesting. I'm going to point out a few really interesting features. The platelets are not raised yet. Just take note of that, okay? Because that's certainly a common finding later in illness. She's got quite significantly deranged bilirubin. Uh, very important to recognize that this is going on. The inflammatory markers evidently are very high, although that doesn't really differentiate her from sepsis at this point in time. Nor does the, this is a, this, this troponin is an ultra sensitive troponin. So troponin of 36 is interesting, uh, needs to be borne into consideration, but in a high degree of sepsis and shock, you certainly can see troponin rises to this level. So nothing that differentiates it entirely yet. She's got evolving renal dysfunction as well. Um, and so, and, and also a little bit of anemia occurring. Um, the first echo was relatively normal and she had that sterile pyuria, as we mentioned. Although when they initially saw the patient, they were probably wondering whether or not this was actually a septic uh, entity with that many white cells in the urine. On day five, she developed bilateral pulmonary edema and she had a formal abdominal ultrasound. Um, at that time, there was some echogenic renal parenchyma and some very significant uh, biliary duct findings and ascites. She was also developing a, a left pleural effusion. Here's her chest X-ray on the fifth day. You can see that bilateral changes. Um, she's starting to develop some respiratory compromise as well. There was a, I can only show you one image here, but this is from the left lower quadrant. She had quite a degree of peritoneal fluid fluid. Not a finding that you're all are unfamiliar with, uh, with dengue, um, but unusual for us, just purely for a septic patient uh, to have all these entities. The gallbladder is markedly dilated here. Um, and that's interesting to note, uh, given her age. And although it's not that easy to uh, interpret here, there was there's some uh, dilation of the biliary ducts. So a diagnosis of Kawasaki disease shock syndrome was made and she was commenced on IVIG. And in fact, if you, you now can follow her course and the reason why I mentioned all of those treatments earlier on is because this is not typical Kawasaki. This is a complex, difficult Kawasaki. And in fact, in the intensive care unit, she got a second dose of IVIG. She ended up on infliximab and she had a dose of methylprednisolone on day 10. This is how long the, the illness was progressing for at this point. What's difficult to interpret here, Particularly early on, I think things became a bit more evident after she developed some of those um, more typical Kawasaki features, but certainly early on, uh, differentiating from septic shock is difficult. And bear in mind the treatments that you're planning to give these patients, uh, you know, giving infliximab or high dose methylprednisolone to a patient in septic shock is a, you know, is a large move to make. So you really need to be confident in what you're doing. But she had persistent fever despite antibiotics with multi-organ derangement and then develop that capillary leak syndrome, which nonetheless can be sepsis or in your community, you know, it could be uh, here in Sri Lanka, it could be um, dengue, um, but it's also typical of this entity, um, Kawasaki disease shock syndrome. Just to kind of highlight that this is not an unknown phenomenon, here's another case um, of a six-year-old who had fever for four days and started to develop a polymorphic rash a sore throat and some abdominal tenderness. And this patient at this stage, um, you know, this could be a huge range of uh, differentials at this point. This is nothing 
that's highly suggestive of Kawasaki yet. They had blood tests. There was concern about their, how they looked. They were given a dose of keftriaxone. And some of the differentials which were initially put down, I've got here, strep invention, uh, HSP, EBV. It was very unclear at this point what this boy was having. On day two of the admission, which was the day six of their fever, things started to deteriorate, getting the fusely tender abdomen, um, some changes to the air entry on auscultation, um, and the blood cultures which had been taken were all coming back negative. So it was un uncertain, you know, what, what sort of entity they were dealing with. This child has developed pulmonary edema, as you can see in their x-ray. And on the blood test here, and this is back in 2021, what you can see is a progression whereby over a period of time, those two days of admission, you start to see some very interesting changes. So there was hyponatremia at the start, which improved, but then persisted to a certain degree. Um, you see that the bilirubin goes from being 27 and starts to rise, and we, very significant finding. The inflammatory markers, as I mentioned before, are not going to help you very much at this point, but this child's starting to develop quite significant anemia as well. And of course, the neutrophil count rises, but that's, once again, not too helpful in the context of potential sepsis either. Here's some ultrasound images um, where you can see this, uh, the gallbladder is dilated and thickening of the gallbladder wall. They were transferred to a paediatric intensive care unit um, a diagnosis of Kawasaki was made with incomplete criteria, I should say. Um, it was given IVIG um, and uh, continued with antibiotics. This child ended up doing quite well, but this was Kawasaki disease shock syndrome. Now, I don't know whether many of you had experience with it, but it's been described in several case series. Um, it presents very similar to septic shock, and some features here would also be suggestive of dengue. Um, there's elements of capillary leak syndrome, as well as cardiac dysfunction. And I'm going to go through a couple of the studies just to discuss what Kawasaki disease shock syndrome looks like. Firstly, there's this question, well, is it a real entity? Uh, and I think that's an important question. In Taiwan, they did a retrospective analysis of some matching, a matching cohort study. And showed that there was quite a difference between patients with KDSS versus just purely toxic shock syndrome. And in particular, the most important features were a lower hemoglobin, higher platelet counts, and the degree of cardiac complications which were evolving during the illness. Things which you would not expect to see, you know, with toxic shock syndrome. Um, then the second question, well, how does it differ from normal Kawasaki disease then? And so this study is from San Diego, and here the study was done prospectively um, and matching a cohort of 187 patients to 13 patients who had Kawasaki shock syndrome criteria. And the criteria which they used were what you could consider just to be any signs of shock for other illnesses as well, hypotension, um, decrease in systolic blood pressure from normal and poor perfusion. So nothing that is specific entirely for Kawasaki, unless you've got the other features. Here, they showed that in normal Kawasaki disease, compared to Kawasaki disease shock syndrome, there was a much higher rate of LV dysfunction and valvular dysfunction, um, much higher rates of coronary artery abnormalities. Um, the resistance to IVIG was quite high. 46% um, of patients with Kawasaki disease shock syndrome did not respond to IVIG. And you'll note that the patient that I presented, the first patient with this syndrome, um, that they went on to try infliximab. Well, they had second dose IVIG and then infliximab and then methylprednisolone. And of course, the need for vasoactive agents was, you know, um, very high as well. In a case series uh, from Colorado, um, they showed that it's a little bit more common in female patients. And interestingly, you might have noted earlier on that um, Kawasaki disease in general is more common in male patients. The platelet counts are uh, considerably higher, um, and they also noted this refractory uh, status compared when treated with IVIG. 
So really, in summary, thinking about Kawasaki disease shock syndrome, you need to think about a slightly younger age, more common female, um, higher platelet counts, bearing in mind that this might occur lower on, sorry, later in the illness. Um, the difficulty with treatment compared to just managing sepsis, particularly because the treatments are just so different. You know, uh, it really requires some very astute thinking and to recognise this or you're just not going to treat it adequately at all. And even when you treat it, it's more likely to be refractory to standard treatment. So that's the end of my presentation. Um, really, in summary, what I wanted to discuss here was just Kawasaki disease in general. I want to, to emphasise the difficulty of incomplete Kawasaki disease uh, and then also to alert you all to um, the challenge of Kawasaki disease shock syndrome, not only in diagnosis but also in management. Um, and with that, I'll leave it there. But thank you very much and I'm, I'm happy to take any questions at this stage if people would like to ask some questions. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Georgeson. So they, uh, they have sent in some of the uh, uh, questions to us prior to the session. So I will uh, move on with that. And so uh, one, of, one of our colleagues want to know the use of infixizumab uh, as a first line treatment of Kawasaki rather than uh, using it as a at latter stage. And how, whether there are any inter interactions with infixizumab with IVIG? Um, look, that's a good question. I have to admit that uh, I'd have to go back to the literature to see whether that's been covered. In, I mean, infliximab is a very serious treatment to give to a child, uh, you know, with lots of potential complications. Um, in Australia, we have a lot more familiarity with using IVIG in a number of other conditions. Um, and so it's a readily available treatment. Uh, I don't know for sure the answer to that question, I'll be honest. Um, but our guidelines certainly suggest starting with IVIG. Yeah. So uh, another small request from you, uh, whether you can repeat the slides with the less likely features of Kawasaki disease and then explain it a little bit further so sure. that we can catch Let me see if I can go back and do that. Um, okay, I'm going to go back here. Let's go here, less likely. I'll find that slide. Where are we? Here we go. Yes, so if everyone can see that now. So we just, this is really clinical skills. Okay, so it's really important. This is um, clinical medicine where you know, these are not laboratory criteria, these are just careful examination. You shouldn't be having exudative conjunctivitis, okay? Now, exudative conjunctivitis is very common in children in lots of conditions and particularly lots of viral infections. And I'm sure all of you have seen this before, um, but it's very common for patients to have, uh, you know, adenovirus, viral conjunctivitis, just in association with a number of general viral infections of childhood. So. Be aware of that. This is not something we should be seeing in Kawasaki. Now, exudative pharyngitis, you can see with hand, foot and mouth. Most commonly, we start to worry about um, streptococcal infections when we see this. Um, this is not what you should be seeing with Kawasaki. Okay, so if you're seeing a large amount of exudate on the, uh, on the tonsils, for instance, that's not typical. Um, oral, ulcerative oral lesions, and you'd all recognize, so this is common with um, also, again, hand, foot and mouth, but this is common um, with uh, HSV-1 infections. Um, there are some other viruses which occasionally will cause this as well, um, but uh, it's, not, it's not a feature of Kawasaki. Um, I think most people would recognize that a bullous or vesicular rash is a different entity. Um, it's not typical, of, you know, we had a look at that polymorphic rash earlier on of that child. So there are a lot of manifestations of rash in Kawasaki, but bullous and vesicular rashes are, to be quite honest as a clinician, I like them uh, because they narrow the diagnosis down a lot, okay? That's an uncommon finding. You're really narrowing yourself down to only two or three entities, to be honest, once you've got one of those. So I don't think many people would make that mistake. 
but it is important to recognize that generalized adenopathy is not it's not typical and that includes spenomegaly so if you're starting to see those sort of changes um you know well that brings in a whole lot of range of entities you, you know one thing we would think about in our community would be ebv um certainly vzv can do that as well uh and then you know you have to start to also think about um you know even malignancies potentially at that point in time um but ebv would be the most common cause of generalized adenopathy for us um i don't believe that's a feature of dengue but you would be able to inform me uh better i, I don't think that's right yeah any other questions yeah uh, thank you so much so uh, a, a little about the adults Kawasaki disease so yeah. uh, some some of our colleagues are interest, uh, interested to know how common is Kawasaki disease among adults who, who haven't developed disease in their childhood and mm. also how do they present and the cause of it yeah yeah look I'm, I'm sorry because that's outside my range I, <laughs> I, I've never seen I'll have to be honest, I've never seen Kawasaki disease in an adult um, and um, you, I have to delve into literature to find that out. I, I, in fact, I'd be very interested if any of the people watching have had experiences of that, uh, because I practice adult emergency medicine as well, and I've been doing so for about 15 years. I've never seen a case of adult Kawasaki. Um, right. My understanding right. is that a lot of it's to do with, uh, you know, an immune response, which is more prominent in, in younger children. Of course, it doesn't mean, one of the things in adult emergency medicine that we have to be really aware of um, is just to appreciate that this is the reason why some people are having cardiac disease in their 20s and 30s. Uh, and once you understand that, you know, sometimes I'm, here in Sri Lanka, I've also, you know, been doing adult emergency medicine. And, you know, there are certainly some populations where you see um, cardiac disease younger, uh, you know, coronary artery disease. But, um, you know, if you're seeing that in the 20s, it sometimes can be quite interesting to go back and reflect on their childhood experiences. It may have been an unrecognized Kawasaki. Mm. Any other questions? So, yes, thank you. So uh, they're, they're interested to know if it, uh, the initial echo of a child is actually normal, uh, mm. if the child has symptoms of Kawasaki disease. In the follow-up, how long after how long do they have to report, uh, repeat the echo? To see no, thank you. Um, that's a really good question. Um, it's actually, uh, there should be an echo. Well, um, I can only tell you what we do here in Australia. But actually, if you want to go to the AHA guidelines, it has very, very specific directions on this. Um, most children will have an echo at the beginning of the diagnosis. They will have a further echo prior to discharge, bearing in mind that a large number of patients will um, respond to IVIG relatively quickly. Um, I've been showing you some of the more interesting stuff, but the standard Kawasaki, you know, usually within two to three days, they're really improving. And so they may be in our hospital system for up to a week and have another echo on discharge. And they're usually referred to a cardiology uh, cardiologist. And I would suggest that they would normally have an echo at least twice in the first year after diagnosis. That might depend upon what findings were there um, at the time of that last echo before leaving hospital. So that if you have got quite significant findings at that time, then they may have closer follow-up. And so it's a variable practice as well. If their echo is completely clear on discharge uh, and they didn't show any cardiac manifestations, then um, the follow-up may not be as close as that. So that sums up my next question, so which is on the follow-up of uh, uh, the uh, children with Kawasaki disease. So it's purely due to, uh, purely on the findings of the echo, or are there any other uh, things or clinical manifestations that we can think of uh, considering the follow-up? The majority of what is happening to the child during Kawasaki resolves. It's the cardiac stuff which is really um, more persistent. Um, I mean, it's interesting to reflect on whether there's other arterial disease also pre prevalent. Um, but in general, and looking through literature, there's not a lot discussed about people having renal artery stenosis or other vasculitides. There seems to be some predisposition to affecting those medium-sized arteries in the heart, and of course, valvular disease as well, which is you know, specific to the heart. So the majority of follow-up, once the acute phase is finished, the child will, you know, recover, the liver will recover, all of those other kind of uh, third spacing issues will improve. Um, the, the primary follow-up is going to be cardiac from that point in time. Sure.
so a little, little clarification. So uh, some uh, some of our, one of our colleagues have said that in the criteria of both classical and incomplete Kawasaki disease, the fever is generally more than five days, mm. which is included in guidelines. But mm. she wants to know whether it means that the fever less than five days almost rule out the possibility of Kawasaki, or is it still uh, comes into the different diagnosis? Yeah. It's a great question, and you can see from my first case that I presented that this is a real issue. What do you do when you see a patient on day three that is already manifesting all of those signs? Okay, um, they're not meeting the criteria for Kawasaki yet, but you're getting very, very confident um, that that's what they're going to have. What would we do? We would just talk to rheumatologists. Okay, that's where we would go, and I say that because the treatments are not light treatments. Okay, it's not like giving a dose of keftraxone. You know, you're going to start giving IVIG, high dose aspirin. If you want to start making these sort of decisions without being sure, you need to have some very specialized advice on board. Um, so we would never do that. I think it's important to recognize that that can happen, but I wouldn't be going giving IVIG to patients on day three uh, without talking to someone specialized. There's obviously a good rationale to do that because the earlier you start the treatment, if you can turn the process off, the less likely there are that this inflammatory process will lead to cardiac complications. So it's not a bad idea to do that. It's just that you have to recognize that, that you're stepping outside a diagnostic criteria. And I think in medicine, you know, we all appreciate that in general, that's where you want to have other colleagues uh, assisting you because you don't want to be treating a septic child on day three with IVIG and have a catastrophe after that. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Um, thank you so much on that. So a little bit out of your scope, I think. Uh, on this question because uh, they want to know about your experience in Australia. So this is not regarding Kawasaki. So one of our colleagues want to know the first line treatment of Gilambari, uh, GBS in Australia, whether IVIG or plasma paralysis is option that is being used there. That's a great question. Um, it's changed over time, actually. Um, plasma paralysis is not as easy to access so I can give you some experience of where I work normally in Australia. We wouldn't be able to plasma freeze an, a child very quickly. Um, and so in the times when we have had a Gillian Barre patient, occasionally what happens is you, you, you give IVIG and then you transfer them to a facility where plasma freezes can be adequately performed. Um, how it works in a more specialised centre where they go for plasma freezes straight up, I'm not sure. I have to answer. I, I couldn't answer that at this point. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and a small query about the case uh, we discussed earlier. So they want to know whether uh, we discussed a case about the Kawasaki case shock syndrome. And in that case, they want to know whether we can consider severe MISC as a differential diagnosis. Yeah, case. it's a great question. You know, because when this stuff came out about MISC, you know, and you're probably all aware, everyone looked around and said, this looks a lot like Kawasaki. Um, and it does. It does look a lot like Kawasaki. And interestingly, the pathological basis may in fact be very similar to Kawasaki as well. I mean, one of the really interesting things about Kawasaki is that we still don't really fully comprehend what triggered it, uh, what triggers it. You know, as I mentioned in the epidemiology early on, there's seasonal, seasonal variation. Uh, you know, in, there's, um, you know, ethnic predisposition. So it's complicated, isn't it? And, um, you know, it seems that with the seasonal variation, we typically think that might be a certain virus circulating at a certain time. Um, and then when this whole MISC stuff turned up um, during COVID, I think a lot of people were thinking, you know, is this a Kawasaki type illness? Now, MISC, however, tends to also occur in older children. Um, so it's not limited to this younger. So it's not the same entity, actually. Kawasaki is much more common, as I'm, I think I said at the beginning, under four, but in those first few years of life, it's the most common. Um, MIC, you know, is not quite like that. Lots of similarities. And very interesting is Lee as well. It's when the MIC started, um, you know, when well, they first started recognizing this in the UK and the US, they were basically giving Kawasaki type treatments, <laughs> straight up because I think that's because the rheumatologists very much thought they were dealing with something which was extremely similar. Um, in Australia, we've had a number of MRSC cases, but it's really patterning off now. It seems to be much more common with the Alpha and Delta strain. I think with Omicron and its variants, which are now more common circulating strains, you know, for the last almost two years in Australia, we haven't seen as much MISC. 
Um, I'm not sure if that's the same as everyone is experiencing here in Sri Lanka or not. I'd say that somebody, well not somebody, there will be a number of PhDs done on MIC and compared to Kawasaki. And I think hopefully what it would lead to is some better understanding of, um, of Kawasaki uh, in, uh, as well. I think, you know, it's interesting earlier on you were asking about, um, you know, using IVIG versus infliximab. I think, so even though I presented, you know, some of the evidence, I think the more astute of you would have recognized that they're not really large case numbers either. You know, it's not, it's not a very, very common illness and it's often very difficult to get the sort of level of evidence you want with an illness like that. Um, and so a lot of the guidelines, even the AHA guidelines, you know, still work in a fairly consensus type pattern rather than on level A evidence for all the treatments. I think that's important to recognize. And so, you know, when you look at these treatments, for instance, that were given to the intensive care patient that had shock syndrome, and you think, well, they gave IVIG, then IVIG, then they gave infliximab, then they gave methylpred, do they actually know what they're doing? Well, it's a good question, but the reality is that it's not, it's not a lot to guide it. So that's the difficulty with that sort of medicine. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, thank you. Uh, so that is, I think, the end of the share of questions for today. So no we would sincerely like to thank Dr. Thomas Georgeson. Uh, he's an adult and pediatric emergency physician from the Canberra Hospital Australia for his excellent lecture and for this precious time that he shared with us. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Georgeson, for your contribution. And, You're very welcome. Uh, it's a great honor. I really enjoyed and um Hopefully I'll see some of you around in Sri Lanka uh, and uh, I am, do come to Lady Ridge Ray Hospital every now and again. So um, thank you. I really, really appreciate you inviting me. It's wonderful. Okay. Thank you very much. So we'll move on to the end of the question. So end of the session. So please find the link of the uh, post uh, session questions in the chat box and please kindly give your feedback and answer the post assessment questions and then you will be receiving your e-certificate for participation. And please note that if you haven't received your certificate in the next three days, please contact us through. Okay, so thank you so much, Dr. Georgeson, once again for your contribution and we wish all of you a wonderful weekend. Okay, have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you.